And our saint of the week this week is St John of the Cross. He was a Spanish mystic born in the 16th century. And John uh, is, I think he is an amazing person. He uh, has left us such a legacy of writing and I'm going to share with you this morning uh, a, quite a full piece um, from a lovely resource book that I have called Celebrating the Seasons and uh, it just gives you some insight into uh, St John of the Cross and his, uh, his very, very close relationship with God. So our Saint of the Week, John of the Cross, poet, teacher of the faith. The Spanish mystic and poet, John de, well, it's, his last name is Y-E-P-E-S, uh, maybe Eeps, I'm not sure, was born in 1542 at Fonteveros near Avila in Spain. His family had fallen upon hard times and he became a Carmelite monk in 1563, subsequently being ordained priest in 1567. Dissatisfied with the easygoing and lax ways of the Carmelites, John was considering joining the Carthusians when Teresa of Avila, another Christian mystic of that time, persuaded him to remain and to help extend her reforms to the male side of the Carmelite order. In 1568, he opened the first monastery of the strict or discalced Carmelites, who emphasised a life of contemplation and austerity. But as reaction set in to their initial success, he was imprisoned in the monastery at Toledo in 1577, from where, after nine months of great hardships, which he alleviated by beginning to write poetry, he escaped. The formal separation of the two branches of the Carmelite order took place in 1579 to 1580. From that period to 1582, John founded and was rector of the Discalced Carmelite College at Baeza. He became prior at Granada uh, in 1582 and Segovia in 1588. But control of the new order soon fell into the hands of extremists and a few years later, the new Vicar General removed John from office and banished him to Ubeda in Andalusia. There he suffered inhuman treatment and died after a period of severe illness at the end of that year. But John is best known for his writings, all of which have been translated from the original Spanish into English. We have a lot of his surviving writing and they're notable for combining the imagination and sensitivity of a poet with the intellectual knowledge of a theologian trained in the tradition of Thomas Aquinas. The themes of his poetry concentrate on the reconciliation of human beings with God through a series of mystical steps that begin with self-communion and renunciation of the distractions of the world. His best known work uh, in Latin, Noche Obscura del Arma has given the phrase the dark night of the soul to the English language. Here he described the soul's progress in seeking and finally attaining union with God through an experience parallel to Christ's crucifixion and glory. And this is a small portion of the dark night of the soul. By dark of blessed night, in secrecy, for no one saw me, and I regarded nothing, my only light and guide, the one that in my heart was burning. This guided led me on, more surely than the radiance of moon, to where there waited one who was to me well known, and in a place where no one came in view. I'd also like to share another longer part of his writing. So I hope you can bear with me, but 
um, it does give us further insight into St John of the Cross. And this is a reading, um, as I said, I've taken it from a book called Celebrating the Seasons, Daily Spiritual read Readings for the Christian Year. And this is the reading set for the 11th of January, so not far off, uh, from The Ascent of Mount Carmel by John of the Cross. And he says, The chief reason why it was permissible under the old law to ask God questions and quite in order for the prophets and priests to seek revelations and visions from him was that in those times the faith was not yet firmly, firmly founded, rather, nor was the law of the gospel inaugurated. Hence it was necessary for them to question God and for God to reply. This he did sometimes in words, sometimes by visions and revelations, sometimes in figures and types, and then again by many other ways that expressed his meaning. Everything he replied and spoke and revealed was about the mysteries of our faith, or matters touching upon or leading up to it. But now that the faith is founded in Christ and the law of the gospel has been made known in this age of grace, there is no longer any reason to question God in that way. Nor need God speak and answer as he did then. When he gave us as he did his son, who is his one word, he spoke everything to us once and for all in that one word. There is nothing further for him to say. This is the meaning of that passage where St Paul tries to persuade the Hebrews to abandon the primitive ways and means of communicating with God which are in the law of Moses and instead fix their eyes on Christ alone. He says, in many and varied ways God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by a son. The Apostle gives us to understand that God has become as if dumb, with nothing more to say, because what he spoke before in fragments to the prophets, he has now said all at once by giving us the all who is his son. Consequently, anyone who today would want to ask God questions or desire some further vision or revelation would not only be acting foolishly, but would be offending God by not fixing his eyes entirely on Christ, without wanting something new or something in addition to Christ. God might give this answer. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, listen to him. I have already told you all things in my word. Fix your eyes on him alone, because in him I have spoken and revealed all. Moreover, in him you will find more than you ask or desire. <laughs>